And so we step into this fourth and closing message on the temptations, handling the tempter, the devil himself. Satan cuts to the chase. He makes the biggest temptation. He wants to be worshipped. He wants Jesus to worship him. If you were a mental health professional, you would do an assessment on Satan and say, Satan, you are delusional. You are completely out of touch. You are psychotic. The Son of God will never worship you. But he tried. Let's stand and hear the word. The word that Jesus quoted back at Satan that day. He drew it from Deuteronomy chapter 6. He quoted verse 13. This is the context from which he drew that verse. Starting in De Deuteronomy 6 verse 10. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of good things, which you did not fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full, beware. Beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after the other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. Remember last week's scripture that Jesus quoted? Here it is, verse 16. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimonies and his statutes which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord that it may be well with you and that you may go in and possess the good land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to cast out all your enemies from before you as the Lord has spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. It's a longer passage, but Deuteronomy 6. Jesus quoted out of Deuteronomy 6 twice to counter Satan. What a key chapter. Before we go into the message itself, let me just say a couple of comments about some pieces of this scripture. First, in verses 10 and 11, God is talking to Israel about how they are going to be brought to a place that has beautiful cities, but they didn't build them. They're going to have houses full of good things, but they didn't fill them. They're going to have wells of clean water that they didn't dig them. Vineyards and olive trees, they didn't plant them. God is going to bring them into the promised land, which is the land of Israel, and they are going to take over what the enemy has built in that area. The Canaanites and the Amorites and the Jebusites have built cities. They have filled houses and dug wells, planted vineyards and orchards. And God is going to give it all to Israel. Wow! That in itself is wonderful. But it speaks to us as a foreshadow of the new covenant. The new covenant is a covenant all prepared for us that we will be given. It's a covenant that we won't earn. It will be given to us. Full forgiveness. Full joy of the Holy Spirit. Full new creation. Fullness of love. Now, these aren't tangible things. 
But this passage is showing us that God prepares something and it's fully stocked, fully furnished. It's also a foreshadowing of heaven. If you think when you get to heaven you're going to have to modify your mansion or your cabin, it'll be perfect. Just the right color furniture, just the right foods in the refrigerator, fully stocked because your Father knows you. That's in that passage. Then the 13th verse, you shall fear the Lord your God and serve Him. Notice, at least in this translation, it doesn't say and serve Him only. I looked in the Hebrew. I don't know Hebrew, so I'm working with an interlinear Hebrew and English Bible. I couldn't tell if the word only is in the original Hebrew or not. I don't know. But it's not in this translation. And we hold that because we'll come back to that a little later. Also in this passage, God urges them to take oaths in His name. Now we don't take oaths today. Jesus simply says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Let your word stand. And we do. But in that day, an oath was based on something. It was authorized by something. It was accountable to something. In the chapters of Matthew that you may have read last week, Jesus talked about oaths. He also fussed at the Pharisees and Sadducees. He said to them, you say, if I make an oath to God, I should not swear by the temple, but I should swear by the gold in the temple. You say, I should not swear by the altar of burnt offering, but I should swear by the gift on the altar. What you are saying, teachers of the law and Pharisees and Sadducees, you are saying that the gold and the gift is greater than the God of the temple and the altar. And that's wrong. So he's clarifying, take oaths in God's name, his temple, his altar. And it also hints to us that the Jews were greedy. They wanted money based things on money, looked for money. So that's in that passage. Jesus says, or the passage says, Moses writes, you shall not go after other gods, other gods in that area. There were all kinds of gods, Baal and Asher and other gods around. Today there are other gods, a little different than then, but other gods. Okay, then lastly, in this passage, it ends with to cast out all your enemies before you. Now, I could have cut this off at verse 15 because we heard verse 16 last week and we knew that. But I wanted you to hear part of the purpose of God's work is to cast out your enemies before you. You will possess the good life and He will cast out, He will conquer your enemies before you. What does that mean? It means what Satan has planned against you and me. As we obey God, the armies of God will go ahead of us and destroy Satan's plans and work. If Satan was planning to harm you, God could interrupt it. If Satan is planning to tempt you, God can strengthen you in it. Gives you a victory. There's a lot in that passage, but I have to focus in on verse 13. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve Him, because this is what Jesus said to Satan. So if we look at Matthew 4 for a moment, the temptation is Jesus took Jesus on a high, high mountain, showed Him all the kingdoms of the world. There are other kingdoms. Let's say we're on a high mountain in the Mediterranean Sea, and we look south. South is Egypt. Jesus, you can have the kingdom of Egypt. Then we come and we look east. You can have the kingdoms of Babylon and Persia. All yours. We look north, Greece and Rome. And Rome was in dominion over the whole world at that time. 
Jesus, I will give you all these kingdoms if you will bow down and worship me. Ha. Huh. What does Jesus say? Is there a pause in the Bible? Is there words about, and Jesus pondered over Satan's offer? Uh-uh. Immediately comes the Greek word, go. Get away from me. You shall worship the Lord only, and him only shall you serve. Jesus was done with temptations. Satan had crossed the line. When you tempt him to worship something else besides God the Father, Jesus got worked up. We know he got worked up when he turned over the money changers' tables, and rightly so. You don't mess with God and the worship of God. It gets really emotional. Okay, so Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 6.13. In Matthew, it reads, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. The Matthew passage, the Greek version, has the word only, at least in the English. Is that word actually in there? Let's get to it. Let's translate some of the words in this key scripture. If you want to memorize a scripture, memorize, worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Matthew 4.10. Now, the word for worship in Greek is proskuneo. That's the verb. It means to kiss the hand towards one in reverence. If Karen would let me, I'd bring her up here and I would kiss her hand. I might even bow down and kneel before her as a sign of love and respect. But I have known from prior invitations that she doesn't want to do that in front of you all. So I won't. I can't even give her a kiss on the cheek in front of you all. That's all right. The word means to kiss the hand of one you are respecting. It also can mean, as the Persians would do, and I think as the Magi, when they came from the east and they came to worship Jesus, the Magi fell down on their knees, and this word to worship, proskuneo, in the Greek, for the Oriental folks, they would get on their knees and then they would bow completely down and put their foreheads on the ground in front of the person they're worshiping. Isn't that interesting that the Muslims, when they worship Allah, will do that. They will get on their knees and they will go completely down on their, their forehead, will hit the, be on the floor to worship Allah. Y'all, if y'all were up for it, I'd like to do that sometime. Only if you're 90 or over are you exempted. To kneel and then to put our foreheads on the ground before God is a sign of honor and worship. That's what the word means in the Greek. So worship, bow down before the Lord your God and serve Him only. Serve is a different word this time, although worship and serve can be synonyms. The word for serve is the word latruo, which means in the New Testament to render religious service or homage or to perform sacred services or to offer gifts or to worship God in the observance of rites instituted for his worship. So what has been instituted to us? The singing of psalms and songs, and we have done that. The study and the reading of the scriptures, we have done that. The commenting and teaching from the scriptures, we are doing that. The sacrament of Holy Communion was instituted, and we do that. The sacrament of baptism was given to us to be done for each baptized person, and we do that. That's what this word means, latrueo, is to serve him in the ways that he has said to serve him, to bring in the tithes and the offerings, and we have done that. To sing to him, the choir has done that. This morning, before church, turned on the TV for a moment, and Ray, there was a Catholic Mass 
on TV. And I just sat there and watched it for a moment. It was during the consecration. And of course, we hear that regularly. But the priests had on the vestments purple. No fancy, just simple purple and simple consecration. And although I've heard that prayer a thousand times, it blessed me to hear the words of Holy Communion. That's what we talk about. Rites instituted for worship. And I was unable to worship. So worship the Lord your God. Bow down before Him and serve Him in the ways that He wants us to serve. And now how about that word only? Does the Bible have that word or did the English translators put it in to emphasize the meaning? The good news is the Bible has that word. In the Greek, it's the word monos. It means alone or only. And serve Him alone. And serve Him only. From monos, we get English words like monochrome and monotone. It means one. One God. Matthew 4.10 Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Repeat that after me if you would. Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. I did it in two parts. Y'all, some of y'all are right there. Some of y'all already knew the whole thing. Let's do it in two parts one more time. Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Excellent. Excellent scripture. Now, let's dig into this temptation. Satan is tempting Jesus to bow before Him. Jesus, think of it. You will have a throne you will be Caesar. You will have servants to cook for you, armies to go to war for you, women to dance for you, gold to be given to you. You will have everything. But, and Satan doesn't mention this, oh, uh, it will cost you your soul. In the movie, O oh Brother, Where Art Thou? I like the music. Really good music. But the one guy who sold his soul to the devil, hmm, that's disconcerting. Don't ever do that. That's real. That's a real covenant. You could sell your soul to the devil to get something in this world, and he'd be happy to give it to you. Don't do it. Thankfully, Jesus can break that kind of contract, but only in this life, not in the next. Oh, and if, Jesus, if you bowed it for me, of course, you uh, heaven, well, don't know that you'd be going to heaven, because that would be sin, and there'd be no one to bring forgiveness. In the movie, God's Not Dead, Mike, I'm going to tell a story from it now. Everybody's had a week to see it. I'm going to tell a story. Mike was our van driver. We were very safe. And uh, he drove us all the way down and back. We sat there and watched in the movie. We saw a Muslim family, a Muslim dad, his daughter who wore the black headdress, at least when he was around. And her name was Mina. And Mina was, had become a Christian, but her dad didn't know it. And Mina's mom was suffering with dementia. She couldn't remember anything. The movie shows a, a housekeeping paid person or coming and fixing the meal and bringing Mina's mother some chicken. And Mina's mother got so excited about having chicken. <gasps> chicken! I haven't had chicken for ages. Thank you for bringing me chicken. But she'd had chicken the meal before and the meal before but she couldn't remember it. So she's excited. Amina visits with her. and As the movie goes on, Mina's dad finds out she's a Christian. He pulls her out of the house and sends her away. Mina goes and calls her brother. Brother, brother, you need to go see our mother. Brother is a 
up-and-coming, rising, greedy, selfish, arrogant businessman. Just been named partner in his corporation. He has everything the world would want to offer. Oh, except he broke up with his girlfriend because she might have cancer. Finally, when he hears that Mina has been put out of the house, he goes to see his mother. His mother is still out of it. Blank slate. She's not there. She doesn't recognize him. She doesn't even know he's in the room. And then suddenly, she starts to speak as clear as you and I speaking to each other today. And she says these words. You are very comfortable. You have all the things of the world, yet you are in a jail cell. The door is wide open, but you are too comfortable with all you have. Too comfortable to leave. All is well until one day you die. The jail cell slams shut. There is no way out, ever. Your comforts are gone. All is dark. You are trapped and condemned forever. Her son hears that. She said it perfectly. And then she went back into her dementia condition, looks at her son and says, Who are you? And the scene changes. Satan has a lot of people very comfortable in an eternal jail cell. You see, he is about to offer Jesus anything Jesus wants. And he'll offer us anything we want if we'll follow him. If we'll bow down to him. If we'll declare him Satan as God. How many Americans are trapped by the temptations and the comforts of power and prestige and positions and pennies in this world? How many are in bondage and they don't even know it or they don't want to know it? They think they have it made, and Satan deceives them. The world pampers them. In their own flesh, they are puffed up until it's too late. And the door and the jail cell slams shut. It's all over. That's Satan's goal. He'll offer us anything to get our soul. But we don't want it. Jesus didn't want it. Jesus came to destroy Satan's work. Jesus could have said something like this to Satan. Oh yes, Satan, I will have all these kingdoms of the world one day soon, but not by worshiping you. It will be, it will be because I will destroy you. I will break every chain. I will loose every bond. And the Bible confirms this in 1 John 3, 8. The Bible says the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work, to destroy Satan. That's why Jesus was led to the desert to face Satan in a, in a temptation square off. Jesus resisted, fired back with the word, resisted, fired back with the word, resisted, and said, tell Satan, go away. It's all done. Worship the Lord your God and him only will you serve. Let's look at Satan for a moment and God for a moment and then I want us together to read a worship scripture. To read worship. Worship is the most powerful condition for running off the enemy, for setting our souls free, for infilling us with the Holy Spirit. Worship is where it happens. We hunger for it. God inhabits it. So, Satan, and if you like to write things in the bulletin, this is what's on the back of the bulletin. 
Satan is created. He is not eternal. He is a created being. Lucifer, archangel of the earth, beautiful, handsome angel, a musician, a wise one, powerful one. He was given charge of the earth. You are the head angel of the earth. And he wanted to be God of the earth. He was created. Secondly, Satan is counterfeit. He is not God. He wants so badly to be worshipped like a God, but he, he never will be. He is, as I've said, he's delusional. He is a liar. He is a fraud. He is a counterfeit. And thirdly, Satan is conquered. Conquered. Broken. Shattered. In Hebrews chapter 2, part of verse 14 and then verse 15 says, Through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. Him who had the power of death was Satan. And Satan would threaten us with it. Listen to this. That is the devil. And release those who through fear of death were, in their, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. A bondage of fear. Paul says in Romans 8, we are not part of bondage and fear, but no, we are adopted. We're not slaves of bondage. We're, we're adopted children. Satan was conquered at the cross. Broken. And at the resurrection, when Jesus was raised from the dead, we saw that death has no more power on us. Death, where is your victory? Where is your victory, O grave? All right, now let's look at God for a moment. Completely opposite from Satan. God is eternal. 1 Timothy 1.17, Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible. God is eternal. Secondly, God is established in Psalm 119, verse 89. O Lord, your word is established in heaven forever. If his word is established, God is established. He is the same yesterday, today, and will always be God most high. God has proven himself through Israel, through Jesus, through the workings in the church. He has proven himself. He has established his reputation. He is the Savior through Jesus. He is the one who forgives. He is the one who also condemns. He is established on his throne. Lastly, God is exalted. Exalted. Twyla Paris once wrote a song, He is exalted. He is exalted. The King is exalted on high. Great song. Choir, could you come up here and sing it? I would love if you knew it. Great song. We could sing, I exalt thee. Pure worship. When we go into pure worship, the Spirit of God falls and stirs, and the enemy is seriously cast out. Can't take it. So I'd like you to stand with me for a moment. I would like us to declare some worship scripture from Revelation chapter 5. I'll be the narrator, but if you all would read, we would all read together the italic print, which are the, the words of the saints and the elders in heaven worshiping God. You ready? I'll take the straight print, you take the italic. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. 
in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. That is the Word of God. Awesome. You know, it's just to speak it rings. And then to sing it. You know, we sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. It's right in that new song we learned, This is Amazing Grace. If y'all can listen to that, kind of get to know it. So on Easter Sunday, we sing it 240 voices strong. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And we declare it, worthy, worthy, worthy to God's glory. Um, Ashton will lead you in it better than I can do. But we'll all know it and do a great job on it. Now as I move to close... Uh, Clint, if you put up that verse again, that Matthew 4.10. Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Let me close with this story. You know, I got so excited about watching um, God's Not Dead. I had such a good time in the theater. I mean, the theater was full, sold out, packed. Great time, great fellowship, great movie. I wanted to catch up on movies. I wanted to see some good movies. So I, I watched the movie Gravity. I heard it came out, got good reviews. Last year, I'm a year behind. I know some of y'all are right up on it, but I'm, I'm not. Watched the movie Gravity. George Clooney, Sandra Bullock, you know, lead actors, good actors, good characters. I like science fiction. Watch the movie. They're always trying to grab onto a, to a bracket so they don't drift off into space. You know, it always has you on the edge of your seat. Good movie. Um, Sandra's oxygen's going down, and, and George even appears after he died. All, all, all interesting things. And when it came toward the end of the movie, and Sandra Bullock, Dr. Stone, was her title in the movie, she's all by herself. It's about the end. Energy's down. Temperature's dropping. It's about hopeless. She can't find a way to fire up the rescue pod. And she has these kind of strange lines. She says, No one ever taught me to pray. I don't know how to pray. And she's fumbling around. She's about to die. And she's saying these lines. I'm like, Oh, help me. If you didn't know how to pray, you start right then. God, save me. That, that's a good starter. I'm going to die. Help me. That's what I'd be doing. If I was in a little cockpit, well, actually, I'd be, God, I'm ready to come and see what you've got prepared for me. My cabin and my yard and a big riding lawnmower and oh, all kinds of chocolate and desserts and can't wait. I haven't had a bite of chocolate today. It's been so busy. I hope I'm praying, God, I've done everything here. I'm ready for the big jettison. Just shoot me out. I'm ready to come to heaven. But I might be a little bit like, God, I'm, I'm, if you could save me, I could put a few more years here in for you. Uh, no problem. But she was way out there. No one ever taught me to pray. And that was, if that wasn't bad enough, she finally figures out, George Clooney appears as some kind of, what, what is he? Appears and tells her how to fire up the rescue pod. It's in Chinese, and she finally figures it out. She gets it going, and the camera pans from the controls. Go ahead and show Sandra, Clint. Show Sandra Bullock, distressed. There she is. Ah, no one ever taught me how to pray. It's pathetic. And then, and then the camera pans up from the control panel up to this brass figure Go ahead and change it, Clint. Show us what's there. Of that. Ugh. Come on. Ah. Bad movie. Bad movie. They don't have any rating systems for spiritual content. They have it for other content. But spiritual content, zero. Negative ten. Are you implying, Hollywood, that Buddha is going to bring her home? No way. 
No way. I got worked up. Beth, I got upset. It's a good thing you weren't around. I'd have been chewing your ear. Karen would have been tired of it. Would you be quiet? I couldn't stand it. Buddha is Hollywood's answer for prayer and the way home. Let's close with this verse. Say it together with me. And worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Karen, would you bring your team and come and sing for us Word of God speak. This Word of God is worth memorizing. During this meditation, may God speak to your heart. The only God, the true God, the one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father of Jesus. Jesus himself is the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit is God. May the Spirit of God speak to us, telling us we're his children, telling us we're his church, and confirming he alone is God. If anyone has a need for prayer, the altar is open.